winter quarter. Thank you for being here. Show of hands, who's been here before? Okay, so this half of the room has been here, and this half is all this, so I'm going to direct my spiel toward you. Um, so we host this every week in the library because we see the opportunity, opportunity to exchange ideas um, and get different perspectives as an extension of our charge from also freedom of information. So we're very glad that everyone's able to be here, whether or not you do every single thing that you hear in this session, or read in the books on our shelves, or find on our periodical databases. We believe that you should have exposure to different ideas and different viewpoints so that we can all learn and grow from each other. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic, we, I've pulled a number of resources that are all available for checkout. And your ID card is your library card. So if you want to check out one of those books, you are more than welcome to. If you have any questions for our speaker, I believe there'll be a little bit of time at the end of the session for questions and answers. And, oh, uh-oh, I've lost my paper. At the end of this survey, I will ask you all to fill out a brief survey to let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can improve and keep this interesting and educational for you all. So, I'd like to welcome our very special guest, Dr. Rachel White from the Joint Institute, Joint Institute for the Study of Atmosphere so, Dr. White. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, and thanks uh, for the you for coming. Um, I hope what I have today will be interesting. Um, I kind of want to keep it quite informal, so if you, if you have questions while I'm talking, please feel free to put up your hand and we can discuss this. So I have sort of a lot of slides that I'm going to go through, but I do want this to be more sort of an interactive a conversation, rather than just me standing up here and telling you. Um, and so, a bit about my, uh, a bit about me. Um, I have a PhD in atmospheric physics from Imperial College in London, in the UK. Uh, and then uh, last year, I came here to the University of Washington um, as a research scientist, a postdoctoral research scientist. Uh, and I'm conducting research using uh, climate models. Uh, not very realistic research. I do more things like taking out mountain ranges and seeing what it does to the climate, um, and looking at things from a dynamic perspective. Um, in order to try and better understand the climate that we have today. Um, but, so that's sort of what I do. Um, and this is sort of a brief, like the sorts of questions that I plan to answer in this talk, um, including what causes ice ages? Um, why does the climate of the Earth change um, over time? Uh, what does CO2 actually do in the air? So we've probably all heard about CO2 and the greenhouse effect, but I want to kind of cover why, what is the greenhouse effect in sort of fairly basic terms. Um, how do we know that CO2 warms the atmosphere? Um, what's the natural greenhouse effect? So the greenhouse effect is not just anthropogenic, human-produced human uh, gases, and so there's a natural one that's actually pretty good for our planet. Um, why is current climate change different from all of the other climate change? So we have sort of records from hundreds of thousands of years back. We know that the climate has always changed. What's different this time? And then towards the end, I want to sort of get more to sort of the social aspect of this. How did we get to this point? Um, why, why are we in the situation we are now? What are we doing and what can we do? So, what causes changes in the average temperature of the Earth? So, we've got sort of records from ice cores, we've got records from fossils and things like that. And so we know that there have been ice ages. There is some debate uh, in the science about whether there have been something called a snowball Earth, where the entire Earth was covered in ice. Um, but we definitely know there have been times when uh, snow and ice covered much more of the globe than it does today. But there have also been times when there have been crocodiles and animals like that living in the Arctic. And we know that from fossils. Like we found fossils of animals that normally live in the tropics living up in the Arctic. And that wasn't because they grew woolly fur and like, put on hats. It was because it was warmer in the Arctic. And so it was warm enough in those regions of the Earth to support this sort of tropical life. And so there have obviously been like, very large changes in the climate of the Earth. Um, and so a lot of work has been done in sort of understanding uh, what causes these. Um, and so the biggest one is, of course, the sun. Um, and so uh, there's a basic sort of uh, concept of seasons. Um, and so the Earth is not uh, tilted like perpendicular um, to its axis. Uh, rotational plane around the sun, um, and so that means that at some point the northern hemisphere is pointing towards the sun and we have summer, and then at some point it's pointing away from the sun and we have winter. And that would be fine if our orbit was circular, and so that wouldn't cause any differences. But our orbit isn't circular, 
we're doing this nice kind of ellipse around the sun. And the difference that makes is that sometimes, when it's summer, in say the northern hemisphere, we're here closer to the sun. Which means that firstly it's summer, and secondly we're closer to the sun. So it's going to be a really warm summer. That also means it's going to be a really cold winter. And that has really big impacts on ice, and the ice um, up in the polar regions. Um, and so, because there's a sort of a feedback effect of ice, um, when there's, when it's colder during the summer, so when we have summer all the way out here, not much of the ice melts in the summer because it's not warm enough to. And that means by the time we get back to winter, we can build up more and more ice. And then we get back to summer and it's not cold enough to melt the ice that much. And then we get back to winter and build more and more ice. And so that's how we can build up ice ages. And then with, with feedbacks, that can like, turn into a large uh, climate change around the whole Earth. Um, and there are a number of different cycles. People are sort of as astronomers have like, studied the cycles of how the Earth goes around the sun. There are at least three different uh, uh, frequencies as a as a 46,000 year one, there's a 112,000 year one, I think there's a 21,000 year one, and they all sort of combine to give, there's a very distinct sort of 21,000 year cycle that we can see in records, um, and they sort of combine to change the climate. But because I'm talking about something that's 21,000 years long, this isn't something we can like see day to day, it's not something you can see from year to year, not really something you see from generation to generation, you have to wait thousands of years to see this sort of climate change. Um, and so what are the other things that could cause climate change on a more uh, immediate and a shorter term basis? And so the question for you, what do you think can change the climate on a shorter term basis? Yeah? Carbon footprints. Yeah, carbon footprints. So carbon dioxide. Anything else? Other greenhouse gases? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good one. So. We talk a lot about carbon dioxide and our carbon footprint, but there are actually other greenhouse gases, and some of them are very important. Anything else? Volcanoes. Ah, nice. So that leads me nicely onto my next slide. Um, so volcanoes. Um, and so this is sort of the opposite, almost, of the greenhouse gas effect. Volcanoes spew out a lot of sulfur dioxide, um, and this they usually um, put it very high up in the atmosphere, in what's called the stratosphere. Um, and it stays there for a very long time, it can stay there for years. Um, and this blocks some of the incoming sunlight um, and actually cools down the Earth. And so if you have big enough eruptions, you can cool down the Earth for periods of like several years. Um, and so this graph just shows temperature um, over since 1750 up to about 2000. Um, and so you, this red line is sort of an, a simple fit based on uh, adding in sort of CO2 and volcanic activity. And so you can see, we've got arrows pointing to all of these major volcanic eruptions. And you can see that the, the black observations dip down very nicely with this uh, red curve. And so volcanoes change the temperature of the Earth for a year, maybe two years, if it's a really big eruption. But that isn't something that can then cause long-term change. You have to have like, volcanoes repeatedly coming off every year, every few years in order to sustain a cooling from that. Um, and so the other thing that is worth mentioning is natural variability. Um, and so this is something that is kind of difficult for climate scientists to deal with um, because we need to understand the natural variability within our system in order to understand the observations. Um, and we don't have observations for very long. We've only been properly, we've only had satellites since sort of the 1970s. Um, and so 30 years is not a long period of time to kind of get a good sense of natural variability. Um, some things change over sort of 50 years, some things change over 100 years. There's a lot of sort of, this shows the cycle in the ocean um, of warm water heading up into the Atlantic, sinking in the North Atlantic, um, bringing colder, denser water back down. And so changes in this can cause changes um, in the heat that's stored at the bottom of the ocean and the heat that comes into the atmosphere. And so this is a very important aspect of understanding climate change, is knowing what part of that climate change is natural variability um, and what part is not. And some of that does have to come from model results, just because we don't have observations um, very well for the last sort of 200 years. But we do have some sense from sort of paleo records of ice cores and things like that. 
that give us a sense of what the natural variability is. And so the last one that we mentioned was greenhouse gases. Um, so we've mentioned carbon dioxide. Uh, what are the other greenhouse gases people can think of? Methane. Methane. And? Animal food. Okay, so that's mostly methane, I think, um, is what's coming from that, yeah. Uh, water vapor. Water vapor. So water vapor is a very interesting one. So carbon dioxide and methane, or methane, we're releasing into the atmosphere. Um, but water vapor is, in fact, a greenhouse gas. Um, and the slightly scary thing about that is that as we warm up the atmosphere, it can hold more moisture. And so we can sort of usually see this, if you go to the tropics, it's usually very humid. Um, the warm air can hold more moisture. And so if we warm up the air, it will evaporate more moisture and there will be more water vapor in there. But water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So we've warmed up the air through the carbon dioxide and put more water vapor into it. But then the water vapor is going to warm up the air because it's a greenhouse gas. And so that's what's known as a positive feedback. And so we do a little bit, and then the climate does a lot more in the same direction. Um, and so that's sort of one of the interesting feedbacks, kind of trying to understand exactly how strong this feedback is going to be, to understand how much warming we're going to get. Just because even if we knew the amount of carbon dioxide we were going to put into the air, we don't have a, an exact handle on exactly what, how humidity is going to so then we move on to what do greenhouse gases actually do? So everyone says, oh, it's a greenhouse gas. Um, it warms up the, the, the climate, the Earth. Um, so here's the question. So the average Earth temperature is, um, over, average of the whole globe over the year, is about 59 Fahrenheit. What do you think the temperature would be without the greenhouse gas effect? Any guesses? Zero. Zero? 45? 45. 32. Okay. Any guesses wildly outside either of those? I like negative 100. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Okay. So actually, our first guess was pretty spot on. Would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. Uh, if we didn't have it, this planet pretty much wouldn't be habitable. Um, and so the natural carbon dioxide, the natural water vapor in the atmosphere is good for us and it's good for the planet. Um, and so how does this actually work? Why, why does the greenhouse effect work? Um, and so the difference is in the type of radiation that's coming from the sun versus the type of radiation that's coming from the earth. And so even though, so all, everything gives off radiation as long as it's above zero degrees Kelvin, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, and I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit, sorry. Um, it gives off some sort of radiation. But depending on what temperature it is, the radiation it gives off is different. Um, and so there's a huge difference in temperature between the sun and the earth. And that's what causes the difference in this radiation. So a little bit of the physics of it. Essentially, the sun is giving off energy with a very short wavelength. Um, and so, can we see it? Can we see the light that comes from the sun? Yes. Um, but CO2 can't really see this radiation. And so, putting more CO2 in the way of sunlight coming in doesn't do that much to the sunlight. CO2 doesn't notice it, the light doesn't notice the CO2, nothing really happens. But the Earth, because it's a different temperature, because it's a lower temperature, is giving off energy with a much longer wavelength. Can we see this energy? No. no. Um, so we can see the Earth, but that's only when we have light from the sun or light from another source bouncing off it into our eyes. At nighttime, the Earth is still giving off energy, but we can't see it. Uh, and so that's why, um, I don't know whether, how much this is noticed, but at night time, if it's cloudier, it often tends to be warmer than if it's a clear sky at night. And that's because the clouds are reflecting some of this energy that's coming off the Earth and reflecting it back down. And so it's actually kind of, they're acting as kind of a blanket. Um, and so that's the energy that's coming off the Earth. Um, so we can't see it, but the problem is that CO2 can see it, um, or it can see CO2. Um, 
And so the CO2 sort of acts like the clouds act at night time. Um, and they reflect some of this energy back down to Earth. And so, it's got a little schematic here. So over on the left, we've got no greenhouse gases. So the sun's energy just goes straight through the atmosphere um, and hits into the Earth, and that's what's warming up the Earth. So the Earth is a certain temperature, so the Earth radiates its longer wavelength energy, and that just goes straight through the atmosphere, um, and everyone's kind of happy. Or very cold, I guess, if there are no greenhouse gases. Um, but over on the right, we've got lots of greenhouse gases. So the sun's energy, which is this shorter wavelength, goes straight through the atmosphere again. That's pretty much unchanged. But then, when we have this Earth's energy radiating back up, some of this gets absorbed in the atmosphere. Um, and essentially what happens is the atmosphere then re-radiates this in all directions. And so instead of just sending it up into space and away, some of it still goes up into space and away, but some of it goes back down. So the energy coming into the Earth is the sun's energy plus this reflected bit from, um, from the greenhouse gases. And that's what's causing us to warm up. Um, and so I kind of like this view of climate change because you don't, it's very simple. Like it's very clear that this happens with CO2 in the atmosphere. We don't need climate models. We don't need sort of ridiculous observations in order to understand this. And so if we know that this happens and we know that CO2 is rising, we know that the Earth's temperature is going to rise. The questions about exactly how much it's going to rise, what's this going to do to rainfall, what's this going to do to extreme events, are all much more complicated. Um, but the basic understanding is there. Um, and so we've got a quick experiment here kind of to see the difference between these two different types of... Uh, of radiation. So we've got heat, which is sort of what I think of as coming from the Earth, and we've got light, which is the radiation that we can see that has the shorter wavelength. Um, and so we've got three potential atmospheres here. We have a trash bag, a picture frame, and we have some glass. And so in terms of light, which of these is more like our atmosphere? Yeah, so we can see through it. We can see through the atmosphere. Um, and so that one's more like our atmosphere. But in terms of heat, any ideas which one? Trash bag? Okay, so let's find out. So uh, any volunteers need at least one volunteer? You want some help? blocking heat, but it's not blocking light. And the trash bag. Uh, 86. 86. I'm not sure. 108. 87. 88. Okay. So that one's slightly higher than the other ones? Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. 71. Yeah. So the trash bag blocks light. 
but it doesn't block them. And so that essentially shows that like different materials do different things depending on what sort of energy it is that's coming out. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so it is it, like the atmosphere is more complicated than that. There are a lot of different gases in it. There are all sort of there are different wavelengths. It's not just the case that like there's one frequency. The sun actually gives off lots of different frequencies. Um, but that's the basic idea of how heat and light act differently when they're absorbed differently um, by different materials. Um, so, a question. When do you think the warming effect of CO2 was first kind of discovered or first known about or written about in scientific literature? What year? 1885. Sorry? 1885. 1885. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Any other guesses? More recent? Less recent? 1940. 1940? Okay. So it was sort of first written about by Spencer Alienius, um, who did an enormous amount of science, um, did physics, did chemistry, won a Nobel Prize for chemistry, um, and lived from 1859 to 1927. Um, and so his first paper on this, um, titled On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground, uh, was published in 1896, so pretty close. Um, he was probably working on it for a few years before that. So we've known about this for over 100 years. Um, and this, again, is just the basic science. So anybody who's sort of saying that, that global warming is not a real thing, we've known about it for 170 years, something like that. Um, and so now we're just kind of quibbling over the details. So we know that increasing CO2 is going to increase the temperature. Um, and this is just a graph showing measurements of CO2. Um, and so they're taken out uh, at an observation base in Hawaii. And so they've been uh, observing from this uh, station for most of the 20th century. Um, and so we have a very good record of what CO2 has been done there. Um, and because it's sort of out of Hawaii, it's surrounded by ocean, there's not a lot of sort of contamination from big cities or other land masses. Um, so it's a fairly clean set of uh, measurements. And CO2 is very well mixed around the globe. There are big variations from one place to another place. Um, and so you can see this steady increase since, well, this just shows since 1960 up to probably about 2014. Um, it's just been going up and up and up every year. And so there are actually, what do you think, anyone got an idea what these small wiggles in the red curve are? Yeah? Is it the different, um, like, summer and winter? Exactly. Summer and winter. So you can see a seasonal cycle in CO2. Why? Anyone get any ideas why you would be able to see a seasonal cycle? in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Yeah? And the warmer ocean holds more. Ooh, okay. And well, in spring and summer, you get plants absorbing carbon dioxide and fall in winter and rotting. Yeah, so that is actually the main answer, is it's a difference in plants. And because most of the land is in the northern hemisphere, and there's less land in the southern hemisphere, that there's a greater proportion of vegetation and plants in the northern hemisphere. Um, and so in northern hemisphere spring and summer, you get this drawdown of CO2 as more plants are photosynthesizing and growing. And then in northern hemisphere winter, uh, you get a sort of release or less drawdown of CO2. And so that's the seasonal cycle that you can see uh, in the CO2. And so we can also look at what CO2 has been doing over a longer period. Um, and so we can do this. We mostly do this through ice cores. Um, and so people go up to the Arctic or the Antarctic and literally drill a huge hole into the ice and pull up a, a meters long, yards long, um, feet long uh, core of ice that's probably like about the size of this room. Um, and inside the ice are little bubbles. And it's just sort of trapped air that was around at the time that snow fell. Um, and then over some of the years, that snow's been crushed into ice, but those bubbles are still there. And those bubbles are essentially bubbles of the atmosphere, the air. 
that was around at the time. Um, and so we can measure the composition of that. We can measure carbon dioxide levels. We can measure uh, levels of other pollutants and methane. Um, and so we can get an idea of what CO2 has been doing over the last, uh, I think, 400,000 years, something like that. At some point, we ran out of ice. Um, and so and when you get too far down, there are a lot of difficulties in how much it's been compressed and actually knowing what the time scale is. Uh, but it gives us a good idea for the last 400,000 years. And so this bottom blue one just shows ice age cycles. Um, and so ice ages are related to the temperature of the Earth. And they're also related to CO2 concentration. And so that's an interesting one, trying to work out whether CO2 causes ice ages, in which case you kind of have to know what's causing cycles in CO2, or whether ice ages cause CO changes in CO2 is quite difficult. Um, particularly when you're looking at things from the order of sort of these changes take several thousand years. If you're looking at a record for CO2 and you're looking at a record of ice, trying to work out which one came first by the order of sort of 10, 50 years is quite hard. Um, and so almost a slightly scary idea of this is that if you um, melt a lot of ice, you might actually end up releasing more CO2 and methane into the atmosphere through sort of feedbacks that we're not that certain about. We do know that melting permafrost is, um, and so frozen soils up in sort of the high latitudes towards the poles can release a lot of methane. Um, and so there could be feedbacks and things that will also release CO2. Um, but so we can see this going up and down with the ice ages. And then this bit at the end is what we've been doing. And so you can see that the CO2 that humans have put into the atmosphere is something that hasn't been seen for the last 400,000 years on this Earth. Um, and so that is going to cause changes that the Earth probably hasn't seen for the last 400,000 years. Um, and the other thing to look at is the speed at which we're doing that. So some of the ice ages are quite fast, but they're still taking place in the order of 1,000 years. We've done this in less than 100. So, um, the differences in that and how the Earth can sort of adjust to that are going to be different. Um, and so this part just shows uh, global temperatures for the last uh, 100 years, so 130 years since 1880. And so there are a lot of differences. People do argue about this a lot, and they're um, about whether these really do show a significant trend. But these are four different, completely independent estimates of what the global average temperature has been um, for the last four years, for, for the last 130 years. Um, and so all of them show this increasing trend, which is exactly what we would expect um, from the increase in CO2. Um, so that sort of, I think that by itself, without even going into like what climate models are saying, in fact the climate models agree with that, is enough to say that we are causing this warming through our release of greenhouse gases. So then we move on to sort of the more social aspect of this. So what, what are the consequences? Why does this matter? The Earth has been warm before. Um, and so why is this a problem? And so <coughs> part of the problem is the speed that we're doing each act. And so we've got these rising global temperatures. Um, and so there are going just if you just increase the average temperature, you're going to have more heat waves and more heat related deaths in the world, of particularly the elderly and uh, the very young are more susceptible to this. And just by increasing the heat, we can't adapt that quickly. We as humans, as animals, cannot adapt quickly enough to the speed at which we are increasing global temperatures. And what is the highest temperature we can adapt to? Depends, I guess it depends whether you mean highest global average temperature, so the problem, the problem with this is that, yes, if the average day is just one degree or two degrees hotter, that doesn't really matter. But when you have your heat waves, if your heat wave is one or two degrees hotter, when it's like, oh, well, I was about to do that Celsius, so sorry, I can't do heat waves in Paris. Um, <laughs> when it's really hot, if it's two degrees hotter, and it's hotter for two days longer at that threshold, then that's when it really starts being a problem. And so even a change of sort of one and two or two degrees can have pretty drastic consequences for 
people who can't cope as well, so people who don't have air conditioning in their houses, um, and some of them are susceptible um, to equal-aged illnesses. Another thing is ocean acidification. Um, and so this comes just from having more CO2 in the atmosphere, and ocean acidification comes from having more CO2 in the ocean. And so, fairly simply, if you have more CO2 above the ocean, the ocean will draw down more CO2. Um, and that uh, increases the acidity of the ocean and sort of changes the chemistry. Um, and so we have been sort of measuring this, and we know that there have been increases in the CO2 content of the oceans. Um, we don't, like, we, we can't measure global ocean CO2. These days we can sort of get a handle of global atmosphere CO2. Um, and so the effects of this and how plants and animals in the ocean will respond is kind of unknown. Um, but that's something a lot of scientists are working on. Um, that problem is trying to understand that better. Sea level rise. So that's, that's a pretty simple one to understand again from the basic level that if we warm up the planet, we'll melt more ice at the poles and also warmer water takes up more space. In the same way that if you heat air, it expands. If you heat water, it expands. Um, not a lot, but enough to make a, a noticeable difference on sea level around the globe. Um, and so that's one that is just going to affect anybody who lives within however many feet or meters um, from sea level. Um, Changes in rainfall. Sorry. <laughs> Changes in rainfall. So this is where we start getting more uncertain <laughs> and more of the um, like climate model results come in, trying to understand what increasing temperatures around the world will do to our rainfall. And there is a general idea that there's this wet get wet and dry get drier effect, which essentially means that regions where it is wet are going to see more rainfall. Regions where it's dry and are already having droughts and water shortages are probably going to see less rainfall. And that's just sort of to do with an intensification of the hydrological cycle of where this water is moved. Um, and so if it rains out in one area, it's going to rain less in another area. Um, and so it's likely to result in more droughts and more floods. But this is, this is something that, again, isn't that well understood yet, and there's a lot of research going on. And it's, all, it's very regional. There are going to be some regions that are dry right now that will get more water, but we can't be sure exactly which ones they are, um, and we're probably not going to know until it's until they've got that climate, until they've got that weather. Um, and so another one that's important but not as well understood as we would like it to be is changes in extremes. Um, so extreme events, like for example hurricanes, but also some heat waves. So heat waves we we can be certain there will be more of. Um, flooding, likely to be more of if it's wet get wet out, is true. What about hurricanes? So there's some evidence that there might in fact be fewer hurricanes, particularly in the Atlantic, but those there are will be stronger. And so it's not exactly a, a win situation even if there are fewer of them because the ones that do appear will cause more damage. Um, but um, that's definitely an area of ongoing research that uh, people are still trying to understand more about. So, this is sort of where we get more into like the, uh, I guess, the conversation of this. How did we get to this point? Why, why did we let it get to this point? We knew about this 100 years ago. We knew we were releasing CO2. Why did we not do anything about it? And so, it sort of comes back to sort of an economic principle of, they call it the tragedy of the commons, but well, I think someone was trying to change the name to something to do with the problem of free access. Um, and so this whole idea of the tragedy of the commons sort of is fairly archaic and goes back to um, when people were allowed to graze their animals on common land. And so there's just a field and it's open and everybody that I know he, you know, he owns the field, everyone can come uh, and graze their animals on the field. And the problem is that nobody owns it. And so nobody really minds, or people, everybody collectively cares if this field is overgrazed and can no longer be used. But the argument is, if I don't overgraze it, somebody else will. So I might as well do it too. And 
and then other people see somebody else over raising it and go, whoa, I'm going to get my cattle sheep onto this field while it's still there, because otherwise I'm seeing none of the benefit. They're getting all of the benefit from this, and I don't see anything. Um, and then that, that happens everywhere, um, and soon you have no field left because the, it's completely overgrazed, um, and then everybody loses because nobody has the confidence to, uh, to use um, as a common good. And so there are some ideas like the, the idea of global commons, and so that's a sort of very local idea, um, but people have been talking about this in terms of global things that are, I guess, available to us as a globe. Um, and so one is greenhouse gases. The idea, we all know that releasing greenhouse gases is, is causing problems, but we also all know that our neighbours are releasing greenhouse gases. Um, and so if they're not going to stop, we're not going to stop, because it's, it's cheap energy. It's economically, at the moment, good for us to be releasing greenhouse gases, um, rather than trying to find a more expensive uh, energy source. Overgrazing still happens in a lot of countries um, when there is common ground and in there's sort of an overpopulation of agriculture and farmers. Um, Non-renewable resources. So that does include things like oil and coal, but also many sort of metals and um, metals used in technology and things like that. We are just using them up with really very little regard for how much is going to be left for future generations. Uh, population growth is an interesting one. It's sort of the same idea in some sense, but there is a certain population that the Earth can probably support. Um, but if that no country wants to be particularly the one to like, reduce their population significantly um, and reduce their kind of power. Uh, and then we have overfishing is often uh, referred to as a tragedy of the commons. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. If I don't catch this fish, somebody else will catch this fish. So I might as well catch them and feed my family, rather than them catching them and then feeding their family. And then everybody catches all the fish and there are no fish left. Um, and deforestation with cutting down trees, um, either for selling as wood or for using the land as agriculture. Um, and so this was an interesting one, kind of applying to everyday life. The idea that everybody driving, using the roads as uh, a global commons. If, if, if nobody else was, it would be a really good place to use. Um, but with everybody using it and overusing it, it becomes a problem. Um, so, how can we solve this? So these are just these are just a few of my ideas. They're not the only ideas. Um, so this is where uh, if people have other ideas and want to join in, uh, I'd love to kind of have a little more open. Um, and so one, one idea is, can we change from a free market economy? And so change to, for example, a traditional economy which is less focused on money and monetary value of things, and produce services and products based on sort of cultures and traditions and religious beliefs, rather than how much money can I make from making this? Um, or just add in more regulation, which is um, going towards a command economy, where there's sort of an overseen power that tells everybody how much they can use the commons. So it's no longer, it's still common ground that everybody can use it, but someone is telling them how much they can use it. And the problem with that is that you then end up with somebody has to have that all-seeing power, and you have to trust them. Um, so those are kind of interesting uh, ways that I don't think are really where we're going to go, but it's sort of an interesting kind of social question to ask whether that's something we should aim for, whether it's something we can aim for. Uh, add the cost of polluting to the market price of it. So at the moment, it is free to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, despite the fact that there are consequences. Um, and so things like carbon taxes, which some countries are putting into practice, is a way of making people pay. People are no longer allowed to pollute rivers freely. Like there are rules and regulations saying what waste you can and can't put into rivers and people have to pay for it. So why not have the same principle for the atmosphere, which is where carbon taxes come in. And the last one is just communicate. They, so a lot of the sort of economic theory around this tragedy of the commons is based around people not communicating. So if everybody agrees, 
that they will only raise three sheep on this commons, then that's fine as long as everybody sticks to that. Um, and so we, there's like evidence that we can do this. So the Montreal Protocol um, was put in place to uh, curb the emission of CFC when we realized that they were creating the ozone hole. Um, and that was, that was really successful. Um, and most models say that the ozone hole should have like, completely repaired itself by 2050 for that. Um, and so we can do this. But the problem is that burning fossil fuels and producing CO2 is significantly more economically uh, good for countries than the production of CFCs, which affect a, kind of a much smaller subset of people. Um, but we do have the UNFCCC, the United Nations Federal of Climate Change, um, which has this conference of the parties. So these are the COP meetings that you might have heard about. So we had COP21 back in December in Paris. Um, so their objective is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous human interference with the climate. How hard could that be? Part of the problem is the phrasing of that, to prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. People have to agree on what dangerous human interference with the climate system is. And for some people, that's uh, a global climate a temperature increase of one degree. For some people, that's an increase of four degrees. So actually coming to some agreement about uh, what that level is and what we should be avoiding is pretty difficult. But the other problem is that we have a lot of different interested parties in this debate. Um, and so this is a huge oversimplification of um, the process, but sort of some of the ideas to give you a sense of why it's so difficult to come to an agreement. And so we have these developed countries all saying, okay, we should all reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. This is the way to solve this problem. And we have developing countries pointing out, well, hang on a minute, you guys have been like burning fossil fuels since the 1800s, you have had all of the economic benefits of this industrial revolution from fossil fuel burning, and we we are only just starting to get those benefits. Like, why 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 have you been allowed to emit all of this carbon dioxide? You did kind of know it was a problem back then, um, and you're saying that we're not allowed to now. That seems unfair, which is reasonable. And then even some of the least developed countries are sort of well, we can't afford to invest in new technology. Um, we're not putting in a whole load of investment into like solar energy and things like that. We're just trying to build an economy um, and get the country out of poverty. And you have small island developing states just pointing out that we really do need to do something and we quite like if we all did it quite soon because otherwise we're not going to have a country. Could we get our acts together, please? And then you have the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, who do have a reasonably valid point that their economy is built around revenue from their oil exports, and if we suddenly cut that off, that the quality of life in those countries will go down, and most of those are very developing countries. Um, and so that is, that's part of the equation that we do need to address. And then the developing, developed countries are kind of going, well, if, we don't, if you don't curb your emissions, like, we're not going to. Like, this, is, this is something that is going to um, be expensive, and so there are investment opportunities with new technologies, but the easiest thing to do right now is carry on burning fossil fuels. Um, and so you guys aren't going to do anything about it, we're not going to do anything about it. Um, and so no one does. Um, but there was, I felt like there was a really big step back in December with the COP21, um, where we, it was agreed, and so there are, I think, 196 parties in this conference of parties, um, which is pretty much every country in the world, apart from a couple of disputed territories, um, which is more a political thing rather than a scientific thing. And so they all agreed that we should curb emissions so that we don't get a global increase of more than two degrees. Um, and every single country, I think, um, put a pledge to how they were going to curb emissions. And so none of the pledges are not legally binding. They don't have to, but everyone said that they want to. Everyone said they're willing to do something. So I think that's a really big step, um, a, a really positive uh, step. And so there are, there is good change. We just
just, I feel like we probably still need to be doing it quicker. Um, from a scientific point of view, it's going to be interesting to see what climate change does, but I'd really rather we didn't get to see too much of it. Um, and so, my final thoughts, um, and with a huge disclaimer, that these are just personal thoughts, these are what I think, but I'm not telling you what to think, I'm not telling you what to do. Um, what you do as an individual is up to you, and what we do as a species, the human race, will be enjoying the global decision. Um, but the first thing is to reduce our use of fossil fuels. Um, drive less, use solar renewable energy, um, use less power at home, buy locally or buy fewer things, like consume less. We as a society consume so much and everything we consume took energy and power to make it. Um, and it takes energy and power to like get rid of it. And so every time we buy something, we are using energy up in that Product. And the other thing is letting governments know that we care. The governments know that this is a thing, and they are trying to do something about it. But the more they know that the people in their country care about this, the more incentive they have to do something. So sign petitions, write letters, join marches, support events, come things like this, um, write articles, and generally spread the word about change. Um, and that you, if you think it's something we should be doing, something about. And so I'm quickly going to pass over to Mary, who has uh, details on some things that people are interested in, of what might help spread the word. I just uh, wanted to tell you about uh, Cascade Climate Action Calendar, which is where you can find upcoming events and other lectures like Rachel gave, uh, and marches, rallies, hearings, you can get involved. And we have a handout um, where you can find out about meetings to go to and um, so, like three of the upcoming events. So get involved if you feel like it and you can make a difference just by showing up. Thank you. Cool. So thanks for listening. If anyone has questions or thoughts or discussion you want to start, feel free.
terms of temperature change and global change, there are a lot of uncertainties in the emissions we're actually going to use and some of the feedback. So we're not we're not 100 sure what I can do when when there's sort of a, there's a lot of talk of wildlife activity and when there's a tipping point in the But I think that's less of a concern now, but we still don't know maybe there's going to be an acceleration of some of these feedbacks. And the second thing is the regional climate is very difficult to predict. Um, we don't make small changes in things like jet stream. Uh, most models predict the jet stream is going to shift towards the poles um, under a warmer climate. But we don't 100% really understand why um, and how and how much. And so things like that, like if it does shift a little bit and suddenly hits the apple, um, can bring about a huge change in the weather. And so it's very, it's very dependent on a lot of kind of specific changes that we don't have to win. We don't yet have the power to do. Um, so there's a lot of work in regional climate prediction, um, but it's mostly based on the next 10, 20 years, rather than trying to look at 50, 100 years in the future. There are so many uncertainties that it's kind of hard to say. Um, and so there are a lot of, a lot of people now of realizing that we're not really going to know the answer. And so we're creating um, ways to be more adaptable. And so one example is the Thames River in London, the Thames Barrier. Um, to, they're aware that they might need to raise this barrier because of sea level rise. Um, but they're also aware that they don't know what level of sea level rise they need to prepare for. And so they're, they're building flexibility into that plan. And so they have sort of certain checkpoints of, okay, in 2020, we need to look again and see what the situation is. And there are two pathways we can take. If sea level rises at this, we can do this. If it's that, we'll do that. And so I think that's kind of the best way of dealing with the uncertainty that, I mean, even, even when models get as good as they're ever going to get and the resolution gets so high um, that you can like, actually see like, different regions of Seattle on a global model, there are still going to be inherent uncertainties in the time system that we're going to have to deal with. So, yeah. Very complex. Yes, that's kind of complex, but makes it interesting. Would I want to get more information on the various tipping points and what degree of warming will be done? Mm. Um, so there are some books. have this sense that the scientists are reluctant to really come out publicly on all this stuff and just the vicious attacks that they've been denying. Yes. Which is you know, you, you get bombarded with freedom of information requests where you can't do any other research. They want every single email you ever read. Thank you. 
turns out not to be true, then people will let you find it in our bill. Like, get a hold of that and it will haunt you for the rest of your life. And so with these things that are very uncertain, actually, of course, it's very kind of model dependent, depending on what particular observations you actually got. I think, yeah, you're right, people are quite reluctant to say. But I think my feeling is that yes, uncertainty major to the points than we were sort of like 10 years ago. Um, we sort of feel like the system is slightly more stable than we did it might be. But there's still a lot we don't know about it. There's, I mean, we don't, we don't really understand the relation of what's going on underneath Antarctica and underneath all of the ice in Greenland. Um, we're trying, but... Yeah. I heard about a volunteer project that people can get into reading ship blogs. Ah. Do you hear that story in the um, So I know there's someone at NOAA, and that's in that old weather. Yeah, yeah so they've got um, a whole bevy of yeah. volunteers who are going coming through these ship logs and finding really interesting stuff about the weather a hundred years ago. And so, and then they make you look really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a really good way of getting extra observations. So I was at a talk the other day where someone done this about Antarctica, and all the voyages that kind of went to Antarctica. They made observations of sea ice and where the sea ice edge was. Um, and we naturally get thank you. Um, an idea of like whether the sea ice was advancing or shooting or how far it is relative to today from ship blocks, because ships write pretty good weather reports. So yeah. Um, uh, from, uh, I I've heard that uh, the agriculture makes the next stage delay. So will it happen? I'm really sure uh, if it happened, I'm pretty sure it's right like the movie the day after tomorrow. Uh, but but how can we recover our uh, uh, society, economic and other things in the scientists saying about it? Okay, yeah, so that's a really very helpful question. I mean, I think generally most of the, the change we would expect is it's quick in terms of like what the Earth has been through before, but it's still not going to be the day after tomorrow. Um, it's not going to shift that quickly. Um, and so we're going to have time to prepare. Um, and what I find, I guess one of the things I find difficult about this is that it is the rich countries who are emitting most of the CO2. It is the rich countries that can afford to pay to mitigate the changes. And so it is the less developed and developing countries that can't afford to adapt. And, and so we can, we can go get a, rent a house, like higher up on a hill somewhere. Um, but some people don't have that choice. And so as a species, we will survive, but very unfairly unbiased towards those nations that developed quicker and caused the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so climate climate refugees and climate migrants is going to become a big thing um, as this gets stronger. So I hear all these stories about we're in the middle of the sixth grade, sixth grade. So you know, kill off food supply and nobody's yeah. nobody's survive. Well but yeah, that's an interesting and so my other I mean very long term say oh they worry about they want to save the earth. And then the earth's gonna be fine. Right. Give it like a hundred thousand years. It might have killed off humans, but the earth will be fine. And then it's the animals on the earth and humans on the earth that it's, are going to suffer from it. Um, and so it's a question of what we want to do about that. Um, but yeah we do seem to be making animals extinct from that it is impressive right Thank you so much, Dr. Wayne.